okay, that's just for your benefit. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce the speakers in the order in which they will speak. Um, so uh, Claudia Pasch is a professor at the University of Bremen, specializing in uh, language learning, teaching and assessment. Now, Claudia has worked in Germany and the UK and is engaged worldwide in uh, teach training. And um, she will bring those diverse perspectives and her experience in terms of the CFR and also from that perspective as a past president of the ELTA and our community to the discussion, I am sure. And we have Denise Whitelock is a professor at and director of the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University. Uh, Denise is a professor of technology enhanced learning and has over 25 years experience in artificial intelligence uh, for designing, researching and evaluating online and computer based learning. And she's recently led the UK's contribution to the adaptive trust e-assessment system for learning, uh, uh, an EU project. So that will be a kind of diverse perspective and we're, we're hoping to get out of our language assessment box and Denise will bring some of those um, developments and ideas from the wider area of educational technology and educational um, assessment. And we have Professor Luke Harding. Um, I've got to scroll up to get your bio, Luke. Uh, so Professor Luke Harding is a professor in linguistics and English language at Lancaster University. Luke obviously is widely known in our field and is also currently a co-editor of the Journal of Language Testing. So can bring that very broad perspective of uh, what's happening in our field in language assessment uh, to the discussion. And Carsten Rover, um, has Carsten joined us by the way? Okay, Carsten Rover is an Associate Professor in Applied Linguistics. Carsten will be our discussant today at the University of Melbourne. Carsten's uh, interest and is widely published in uh, language testing, second language pragmatic conversation analysis and quantitative research methods. And Carsten will be bringing his uh, particular insights and perspective to join together the common threads and themes that we come out of our symposium participants uh, insights. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to our first speaker, uh, Claudia, who can uh, take the floor. We will be sticking to around 15 minutes for each speaker, and I will <coughs> step in uh, when we get to those time limits so that we can move on and have some time for discussion. And Claudia, you'll be sharing your screen to present your slides, won't you? Thanks, Jamie. Yes, I will do that. Does it work? Can you see my screen? We can indeed. Cool. Thanks for the introduction, Jamie, and thanks for having invited me. I'd like to take an experience-based approach, so to speak, and COVID has very much shaped my experience in the past one and a half years. And I'd like to briefly share the experiences regarding language testing, validity, and technology in assessment. First, I would like to talk about a project we embarked on, and I did a work in progress presentation yesterday, so excuse me if you have seen that yesterday, computer-based algorithms and the integrated construct. Then I'd like to briefly talk about technology-based remote assessment due to COVID in our languages center, and then talk about remote collaboration when developing language assessment and language tests. First project, the computer-based algorithms. It's a DFG funded project to analyze the dimensions of integrated reading into writing tasks. And we are also exploring in that project in how far computer-based indices can predict or explain ratings in relevant assessment criteria. And those are source text use, discourse synthesis, and linguistic quality. And here the CFR comes in. We base those descriptors on the CFR descriptors. And we're exploring uh, several indices in the comparative text analysis between the source texts and the student produced texts. We are looking at those indices that uh, are provided in ACO and TALES regarding vocabulary sophistication, syntactical complexity, cohesion indices, uh, n-gram frequency index, and other indices. And we are working with a colleague, uh, Pablo Penaidoma at the University of Halle on a semantic similarity index that is yet to be developed, we are not yet there. And here what we realized is the sheer number of indices is mind blowing. There are, I don't know, a felt a feeling of a thousand indices out there and uh, it's kind of hard to make the right decision which ones you want to choose and uh, work with. 
So that's kind of a challenge. There's too much out there, so to speak. And uh, our assumed dimensional structure, we will use multidimensional IRT scaling, structural equation modeling in order to test hypotheses regarding the dimensional structure of different indicators for writing quality. And my colleague, Johannes Hartig at the uh, Leibniz uh, Institute for Educational Research has developed this assumed structural model that we are going to test where we'll look at human ratings and computer-based indices and any task um, effects. Um, the results of uh, these uh, analysis will feed into an innovative assessment scheme, or so we hope, where we can combine human ratings and automated text analyses. Ideally, we wouldn't need any human ratings, but we, we are not there yet. Um, that feeds into the reliability and validity of the assessment. And the results will also give insights into the dimensional structure of integrated reading and writing. And it will yield insights into certain features that are relevant or typical for certain CFR levels in order to sharpen the construct. So that's the first area where I think technology can help us uh, enhancing validity, reliability, and uh, our understanding of the construct. The second area where we were forced to gain experience since March last year is remote assessment. Um, the background here is the Languages Center uh, in Bremen. We cover courses for four universities in the Land Bremen. We had to go online with over 200 courses overnight. We had no prep time and we had never done that before. Uh, not only was the teaching online, but also the end of course exams, usually depending on the courses, we cover all four skills. Our learning outcomes are aligned to the CFR and we use the Moodle platform amongst other platforms because uh, every university that we cover for has different learning platforms. So it was kind of a huge array of platforms. Um, we focus here on Moodle now. We transferred the reading and listening papers to Moodle. We didn't have time to develop anything technology-based. We really just put the papers in Moodle. The writing part was either put in Moodle or teachers chose uh, that students uh, developed a portfolio over the course. Uh, we had timed tasks. The teacher and all the students were present in Zoom. Zoom is software that is licensed by the university. We are not allowed to use Skype. And uh, students show their room and their screen. That was also um, discussed with the university and that was the uh, policy university-wide and uh, we used Zoom for the speaking part. Either the presentations were done in Zoom before the whole class, if it was a presentation course, or we had an interactive speaking exam in Zoom with the teacher. And we've refined our approach over the last three terms. We're now in the third term doing the online teaching and online assessment. And uh, the benefits are clear, all students can access. Um, by now, the technology aspects and issues have been solved and uh, all students could get their credit points, which was really um, the major aim that we had. And the challenges were get a, getting the paper-based tests online in the format that the layout and the, the format allowed the students to work on these uh, paper-based tests. So there were technicality issues, the prepare presentations sometimes were prepared and then read aloud or learned, learned by heart. So there were issues with uh, spontaneous presentations. Uh, we had also issues where texts were copied into Moodle for the writing part, uh, texts that the student very likely has not written themselves. So here we have uh, concerns about the validity of the assessment and the teachers felt they had little control over what students really were doing during the exam, but that was really a minority of cases. When we look overall, there weren't that many obvious instances of cheating. So that's an aspect of test security. And yesterday in the SIG meeting, we had a presentation on uh, remote proctoring and um, test security issues, and there is no easy way so far. Um, 
ways forward what we have done last summer we developed an exam guide together with our teachers for teachers and students an exam etiquette and technical requirements then since winter last year all students have to sign a confirmation that they do not use any assistance that's university-wide and this summer we're going to look into revising our understanding of ethics during an exam together with our teachers we would like to develop awareness amongst the teachers and the students because in a way the teachers peep into private spaces of our students and on the other side we need to discuss with our students the consequences of cheating and we are kind of envision envi envisioning um, a code of ethics for the remote language classroom and for remote exams in uh, in classroom-based setting. And I also think we need new literacies on technological possibilities and how to use them in a pedagogically meaningful way, because knowing all the ins and outs of technology doesn't necessarily mean that you also use technology in a, in a pedagogically meaningful way. Let me now come to the last area briefly, remote collaboration when developing tests. Um, I have some language assessment literacy training experience in Bremen, in Cuba and in Indonesia. And uh, during COVID, it got ever so important um, to collaborate online. Collaboration is a seminal aspect for LAL training and test development in any case. And in an ideal world, you'll sit together and do it together, but the world isn't ideal. So we need remote spaces, even in an, in a in a face to face meeting and in a situation where you can do the training face to face. We realize that remote spaces are needed, repositories for materials, platforms for feedback on task development, spaces where teachers can work together collaboratively. Cuba and Indonesia are huge countries, and it's not always possible to travel and come together. So a collaborative online space is really valuable. And here also computer app mobile literacy are needed to use these spaces and make the best use of your time. And I have to say, I was really impressed with the digital ease in Indonesia, the teachers, how they worked and collaborated both when I was there face to face and as well as in a recent uh, online seminar. That was really good to see how they take, they make use of all the technological uh, possibilities and i'm also very impressed with the moodle lal course in cuba recently my colleagues there set up a lal uh, uh, a moodle course to take our um, language assessment literacy training project further and that was also really impressive to see so to sum up um i think technology can really enhance reliability validity sharpen the construct support access and exam delivery and facilitate cooperation amongst teachers and exam developers uh, but we do need a better understanding of for example available automated indices we need more or different digital literacies so that we can really make the best out of the technological possibilities and i find it increasingly important that we discuss our understanding of ethics when it comes to exam delivery and the use of technology and with that slide i would like to thank you and uh, I hope I was still in time. I'll stop my screen sharing here. Okay, thank you very much, Claudia. And uh, Carsten will be joining us uh, in a few minutes. Um, so a slight uh, technical glitch there with Carsten joining us, but he'll be coming online as, um, soon as well. So we will now move uh, to our second speaker. So I'd like to uh, ask Denise to share her screen and to take the floor. Thank you, Denise. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me just put full screen up. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I've been working in um, AI and feedback systems for a long time now, not necessarily in language learning, but I'd like to share with you my experiences and maybe concentrate on the pedagogy this morning in my presentation. So how's AI supporting assessment and learning? How, how is AI assisting with uh, assessment online, summative assessment? I'd like to talk about the Tesla project. 
And then the role of students and assessment and what challenges we have, especially with standards and frameworks. But underneath all the um, presentation today, I want you all to bear in mind um, that assessment drives learning. With many papers on this, one of the first uh, professors in the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University wrote a seminal work on assessment driving learning, that's Derek Rantree. And of course, students always want to know what they're going to be assessed upon because that's what they will pay attention to. And um, how do we um, use what we know about feedback and how people learn to assist them in a journey which is not altogether unproblematic and it's very difficult to um, actually understand what learning and what drives learning is all about. So let's start with some early work in AI. This was Ali Fowler's work. She was at the University of Kent at the time. And she built this CAL system for the um, languages stuff. And as you're all aware, you know, we can have very large classes. So here there were 400 students on the first year course learning Spanish. And um, they had two tutors who couldn't uh, respond quickly enough to their exercises and work they were doing. And um, so she built this system, and this is a very early um, uh, form language, very early on in our work. And um, so they were able to um, give automatic, very quick feedback to the students. And as you all know, that with language learning, if you don't attend immediately to the feedback, you can get fossilization of errors. And this is what they were really concerned about. But so they gave the students um, two attempts to um, try through this assessment. And what they learned in piloting this and then getting it right eventually was something that we can all learn from. But, you know, if you unequally wait, the attempt. So you, you uh, let the students have some marks for the first attempt and then the second. They found it was better, you know, to give more weight to the first attempt. And that was because if they didn't, um, students didn't give enough careful consideration to that response because they knew they were going to get some feedback. So let's try, let's quickly have a go. Let's see what the feedback is, and then we can adjust. So the marks can vary depending on the assessment and feedback time, but it's always best to give more weighting to the first attempt. Something that I think is important if we're going to do much more online testing. Now, we've all been involved in COVID and had to move very promptly and fast with um, moving our students online. And I'd like to talk to you about a, a big European project I was involved in, which finished a year ago, which um, really can help with moving our students to online testing. And um, this was an action, um, not a research project, in that what we were doing was putting together a number of technologies. And this was voice, voice and face recognition, keystroke pattern detection, anti-plagiarism software and forensic analysis. And there were 18 euro partners involved ourselves at NIET were responsible for the, the evaluation and we also um, did some testing. We were, um, there were 
you know, a lot of uh, <laughs> universities and large numbers of students testing these systems. We had the Anatolo uh, University from Turkey, Uvascular from Finland, the Open University of the Netherlands, ourselves in the UK, Sophia University and the Technical University, and the Open University of Catalonia. So the systems were put together, built and tested over three years. But the thing that's important here, especially for us now in, in, post, in COVID and post-COVID, some of us are saying it's going to be the uh, COVID decade, is that um, consideration was given to uh, GDPR, ethics, and um, how the system would be treated with the data. And so from the very beginning, we had um, a group of lawyers working with us for the, from the University of Namur. And so that the um, agreement at the beginning of the um, system, what you had to agree to was carefully explained, was legal, and um, preempted GDPR, which we knew was going to be on the horizon. So what were the languages used in the courses? Um, we had Bulgarian, Catalan and Spanish being used, Dutch, English, Finnish and Turkish. And um, how do we go about setting all these systems up and what did we do? So we invited um, tutors, lecturers to become involved in our different universities. And we um, undertook a number of uh, different tasks, assignments and activities in these courses. And there was formative assessment as well as summative assessment. So the students became used to using the tools. And of course, you have to uh, prime a system. So with the audio and video, you have to take pictures of yourself, move your head in different ways so that the system can recognize you. And also with the audio and um, the uh, language um, lecturers um, made a lot of use of um, the language software, the audio software for their assessments. So coursework was used, um, presentations, um, forum were used as well for discussions. There was reading and reviewing of resources and there were quizzes as well as online text submissions. And the system can be um, uh, <clears throat> used, tailored to whatever university systems are needed for assessment and um, how it would, if, if cheating was uh, recognized, how the, the, the individual universities would deal with those issues. Also, um, we became very aware and our students were aware <clears throat> of the increase in essay mills, where students can um, go to a company, uh, give the title of their essay, and have their essay um, written for them. And um, this is becoming quite big business, especially in Australia as well. So these sorts of systems where you are working formatively and then um, the summative assessment takes place, one can be sure that the students, it's the students' own work. So what were the results that, you know, from using uh, the, the, the Tesla? 
Most students had a positive experience. We experienced some problems with technology, of course, which we overcame during the um, piloting. But what's most important here was the students um, were wanted to take part because they wanted their examination results to be trusted, to prove that the essay was their original work. Students don't take kindly to their colleagues who were cheating <laughs> in examinations. And um, more importantly, they were concerned about future employment and that employees would trust the examinations they'd taken in their universities and that the employers would know that everything was being done to avoid cheating and systems were, were in place. So they were concerned that their colleagues didn't cheat and that we could have a trusted system. And of course, there are ethics involved, and I said about GDPR, and um, the whole system is a complete package where you normally have to go and buy, you know, one tool or another from a company. These are all together, and the most popular um, uh, tool for students and students um, for essays was the Keystroke Dynamics because we all have our own way of typing. Once you put some uh, text in that you, you, you've um, some test text, then it's very easy to detect if you are the person you say you are submitting the text for the examination. So um, please go and have a look at the Tesla project. There are, um, uh, it was a European project and parts of the system are free and can be used. I'd like to come back to talk about students and assessment and how they feel. These are some pictures uh, that Liz McK uh, uh, Chris McKillop was um, taking for her PhD. She wanted to set up a system for uh, students to write about some narrative about their assessments and their feelings. She found she had very little data, but when she asked students to write, to draw their experiences, she got these sorts of diagrams. So, you know, how difficult it is and how students feel um, the learning process, coming to the Holy Grail, getting their examinations and their certificates is quite a journey. And I think what's important in this one is the uh, sign careful of edges, you know, careful you don't fall off in this journey. And this is what's one of the most in shocking ones, especially when coursework is considered to be uh, joining me in death. So I think we should really consider how the students feel and how we introduce new systems, et cetera, where they are feel comfortable and where they fear everything is fair and equitable. I'm sure if I was in the room and I could see you all and ask you to put your hands up, you would all um, uh, say you were constructivists in your way that you teach, that you know, you're not behaviorists, you don't believe that you know, people are empty vessels, we just talk to them, give them a few examples and it all pours in and everything is fine. So we, we have a lot of activity, new ways. We're always trying to find at the Open University, we have 170,000 students. We do a lot online um, and we have a lot of learning analytics. We know how people behave online and we can send them reminders, um, you know, get hold of their tutors and say someone's not responding. Um, you know, what can you do? How can we assist, et cetera? So there's a lot of data floating around, which, um, you know, we have an ethical policy at the Open University. There are lots of issues within standards and frameworks. So although we've got this constructivist push, there's always, you know, reliability and accountability pulling us back. So with that in mind, 
that's why how we need to think about moving forward with any standards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, so now I would like to call on our last speaker before we go to the discussion. So uh, Luke, could you turn on your video and share your screen? And uh, okay. Thanks, Jamie. Okay. I think Denise, you have to stop sharing first, don't you? Yeah, good. Okay, there we go. Hand over to you, Luke. Thank you. Um, and just checking, can you see my slide? Yes. 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 Okay. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to very briefly cover um, a topic that I guess is related to both of the previous presentations as well, which is um, ethics uh, and the role of professional organizations within this broader theme of technology driven language assessment. Um, so I guess it's no surprise to anybody um, listening here today that technology has really um, become extremely prominent and common um, in our field. So if we think about even the past um, five to 10 years, um, we can conceptualize uh, technology kind of feeding into all of these new types of applications, automated item generation, item banking platforms, computer adaptive tests, computer-based delivery, remote proctoring, um, automated scoring, automated feedback, uh, rated training platforms, um, security systems like post hoc authentication. Uh, so technology and particularly digital technology um, is really becoming a, a, a central part of our practice um, as language assessors. Now, in terms of ethics, um, I've presented a couple of times on this topic, and I find this a very useful uh, kind of point, um, Moore's law. Um, Moore suggests that uh, as technological revolutions increase their social impact, ethical problems increase. And the reason for this um, is not necessarily that technology is inherently bad, um, but that this phenomenon happens um, not simply because an increasing number of people are affected by the technology, but inevitably revolutionary technology will provide numerous novel opportunities for action for which well thought out ethical policies will not have been developed. So the issue is that technology um, brings with it new um, and you know, hitherto unforeseen um, consequences um, and the rapid introduction of technology requires a sort of rapid response um, on the ethical side by people who are using that technology or who are affected by that technology. Now, in language assessment, we can see um, some of the current problems or ethical conundrums, if you like, that the um, use of technology has brought. Um, I'll just mention three very briefly here. Um, one is uh, this issue of washback from automated scoring. Um, now, automated scoring has been used in our field for, for, for some years now, um, even in some high stakes testing situations. Um, I think we haven't seen enough uh, research on the washback uh, or the impact of automated scoring. Um, it's clear that it has the potential um, to change the behavior of learners, uh, the way in which they relate to exams um, and to learning, particularly in test preparation situations. Um, and a very interesting study has been published recently by Knock and, and colleagues um, on exactly this. Um, and I recommend you check it out. It's in uh, the journal Language Testing. Um, but we know also that even in very low stakes situations, like the use of automated writing evaluation in classrooms, um, the research in that sphere tells us that learners can uh, respond in a very, um, with a sort of metric driven behavior um, in trying to crack the system um, when they're engaging with those kinds of systems. So we need a lot more research uh, on the impact um, of automated scoring on, on learning, I think. Another issue with respect to language assessment is the potential um, for the 
kind of amplification of native speaker ideologies or discriminatory constructs, which are, are kind of baked into algorithms from the design stage. Um, so this is particularly prominent, I think, in pronunciation assessment, where um, conceptually our field has been moving more towards um, you know, valuing intelligibility and comprehensibility and not a specific uh, native speaker model, um, but the ease with which a, a single native speaker model can be implemented in um, scoring systems and algorithms um, means that we are in, in some places, not all, but in some uh, assessment situations, we are seeing it sort of drift back to uh, the, the kind of central place of the native speaker in uh, these kinds of automated scoring systems. And I think this has potentially very harmful effects um, on, again, on learning um, and on the broader ecology of, of, of um, language education. And a third issue um, is um, that language tests are increasingly becoming sites of surveillance. Um, uh, and this is being amplified through security technology. So we've seen this particularly in the past 18 months through the rapid uptake of remote proctoring. And of course, remote proctoring served a very useful purpose to allow for take at home exams, um, but at the same time brings with it um, various kind of ethical issues around um, increased surveillance, um, through the kind of inequalities that uh, might uh, be kind of amplified through uh, you know, people not having secure or, 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 or calm uh, home uh, environments, and also through these issues of, of kind of data and where we would store what is essentially sensitive data um, of video recordings of people in their, in their home environment. So these are very kind of current um, ethical issues which um, I think, uh, uh, you know, perhaps the field um, needs to be discussing more and certainly needs to be uh, considering uh, how to deal with um, in an in a, in a ethical way. Um, now, it's worth pointing out, of course, that these issues are not unique uh, to language testing. And in, in fact, um, I think it's important to see our field as part of a wider network um, of areas of human endeavor where this kind of digital revolution is creating a range of ethical conundrums. Um, so the issues raised on the previous slide relating to essentially kind of behavior modification, uh, the potential for discrimination and issues around privacy and data storage, um, these sort of abound in a range of other fields from, from translation to uh, law. And you can see here um, just some recent articles in uh, the conversation, um, you know, a, a sort of web-based um, uh, magazine. Um, which deal with different issues uh, where you can actually see some connections, I think, to some of the, the points I, I was talking about um, with respect to language testing. Um, another important issue, I think, to note um, is that um, it's, again, it's not just about, it's not a matter of technology being bad, inherently bad. Um, I'm actually a big fan of technology and of technological innovation. Um, but part of the issue here, I think, is, is well summed up in this quote uh, from uh, Sulet Dreyfus, uh, says that people fear AI and machine learning because they think it's about a shift of power from human to machine. But actually, it's also a shift in power between the individual human and the organization. And that becomes very important because you have to think about how we will make the organization accountable, what transparency requirements are there. And so there is this sort of notion of a shift um, in power to a more sort of concentrated group um, who understand technology, who create technology, um, and who can see the sort of inner workings of that. And I should add that this isn't necessarily suggesting that it's entirely concentrated in the hands of test providers. We now see test providers um, also drawing on third party technologies uh, or providers of different technologies such as off the shelf scoring systems, um, 
or security technologies developed um, by other organizations. So test providers may themselves um, have to deal with this kind of shift of power um, to other organizations. And so it creates very complex relations, I think, between uh, test providers, uh, between test takers and other stakeholders, and of course, um, between these other sort of ancillary uh, developers of, of, of technology who were starting to engage with more um, as a field. So current developments, um, there have been some, some, some really useful current developments. Um, there's a, there was an ILTA task force um, with Benjamin Kreml in India Plow and Vivian Berry who um, updated guidelines for practice um, to, to kind of focus a bit more on computer-based uh, testing. Um, but it's also worth noting, and I've actually been having a, a conversation with Benjamin Kreml just this morning, that many of the issues um, are to some extent dealt with in the existing codes of ethics um, for ILTA, um, which you know, I think ILTA is also to some extent party to. Um, but the issue is interpreting these existing principles, these, these ethical principles, so that they can be applied to new scenarios um, and raising awareness. Um, and of course, also encouraging organizations to comply and take these uh, seriously. I'd also just like to point out um, this very new um, report, uh, which Nick Saville was involved with, and I saw Nick kind of publicize this on, on social media, the ethical framework for AI in education. This is a, a really useful document, and I recommend anyone who's dealing with um, AI uh, or with technology and assessment to, to have a look at it. And if Nick is here, he may want to say something about it later on um, in the discussion. But I'm just going to wind up now um, by just saying a couple of things about what might need to change in language assessment. Um, I think that there's a sort of um, duality here about what might need to happen. On the one side, we have the social responsibility of assessment providers and users. And what we need to see, of course, is a strong commitment to ethics, um, to impact and consequences, to transparency and to accountability. Um, we need a sort of um, responsible innovation. And this um, actually um, chimes nicely, I think, with a recent talk that Bart Degas gave at Alte, um, talking about language testing ethics and our place in the ecosystem, and particularly about the social responsibility of, of, of uh, language test providers. Um, on the other side, it will help for test providers um, and users to remain accountable if we also encourage a sort of deep critical language assessment literacy among test takers and other stakeholders. But this assessment literacy um, needs to be perhaps broader than our current conceptions of assessment literacy involving areas like data literacy, algorithmic literacy. And I think very importantly, and into the future, we'll start to see this happening more, um, an understanding of legal rights and protections um, in terms of um, appeals and, and complaints against um, machine-based decisions. So finally, um, some questions for Yalta, and this is really just to prompt discussion later on, and other professional organizations. How could a professional organization like Yalta help? Um, well, one possible thing, and this is one thing among many, is to consider a shift towards um, making test takers more central um, in what we are doing uh, and in what we're talking about, and perhaps the provision of rights-based information designed for test takers test taker advoc advocacy groups within an uh, organization like Yalta, test taker representation on executive committees. I think independently funded impact studies would be very useful. And this is something that a professional organization like Yalta could uh, help with. And a big question, and this is again one for the discussion, transparency requirements rather than guidelines. And I think there's a very interesting distinction here between um, recommendations and um, compliance, um, transparency requirements for institutional members. So I'm going to stop there um, and it will be good to pick up on some of these a bit later in the discussion and I'll hand over to Carsten. Okay, thank you very much, Luke. Yes, and we'll welcome Carsten, our discussant. Carsten joining us from the other side of the world, of course, in Melbourne. 
where it's uh, 6 30 p.m so welcome Carsten and I'll hand hello over. everyone and sorry I came in a bit late time differences um played a little mischief here let me share my screen as soon as I can work it out here we go all right yes um thank you uh, Claudia, Denise, and Luke for your presentations. Um, very interesting perspectives on something that, as Luke said, you know, technology is not new in our field. This has been bubbling along for a while, and there was sort of a heyday of technology in the late 90s with computer adaptive testing, and everyone thought this was going to, at least I know this more on the American side of things, this was going to change everything and revolutionize everything. And it didn't quite work out that way. And you know, technology has played an increasingly important role, but it has sort of moved slowly. And right now, I think what we're seeing here is almost like a case study in evolution. So you have an you have environmental pressures on not on a population here, but on our entire field of language testing, the, the whole COVID pandemic situation. Um, has forced us to, as we have done for teaching, you know, to pivot very rapidly um, in our operations. And technology sort of became the, the quick go-to solution. So COVID in, a, COVID in a way has turbocharged, I would say, the role of technology in language testing. And because we've had to do things so quickly, I mean, I don't know if it was how it was for you, but I felt last year at this time or a few months before that, that I was getting whiplash by the speed of change from the speed of change. We had to move so quickly that our thinking about it in terms of theoretical frameworks, in terms of standards, in terms of what are the consequences of what we're doing here, our thinking is now starting to catch up now that we've sort of gotten our, our operations uh, together and, and are working in this new environment, still finding, finding our way in many instances. But now we start, we're starting to think about this. And as Luke pointed out, um, while there is a lot of potential, it's very important to think about it. So, I want to frame this sort of in terms of opportunities and challenges, at least initially. And all of the presentations, especially Claudia and uh, Denise, pointed out some of both. You know, um, so Claudia pointed out how technology can enhance assessment, and we have seen that uh, before. Uh, the automated testing of writing is nothing brand new. Automated testing of speaking is around. Um, automatization of other scoring processes has been around for a while. There's now experimentation with um, spoken dialogue systems where you can actually, the computer can pretend to have a conversation with you. So there's a lot of potential here. And as Claudia pointed out for writing, you can have broader writing constructs. You, you don't necessarily need to be as highly constrained as many of the big tests are because the universe of operationalization is defined razor sharp. Uh, universe of generalization is defined razor sharp. You can use indices like they often, uh, there are a lot of freely available tools out there that can reduce rating load and make the test more practical because developing from the ground up, like I know ETS did for, for TOEFL writing, um, a system that will automatically score writing is a big, big effort that takes years and years to, to really get off the ground. And interestingly, Claudia related it to the CEFR, how we can then try to implement CEFR descriptors. However, even using indices is quite tricky because how do we weight them? You know, what is our construct of writing? We're getting to this question that was also raised in the presentations are our, or in the Q&A actually, uh, are our constructs changing? Do our constructs need to change? Is technology changing the construct for the better? And I, I do agree that, you know, at some point we do need to get our heads around also integrating things like texting and messaging in our, in our tests. Is it changing it for the better? 
or to what extent does it become a cart before the horse sort of thing? Is the technology actually driving the way we're testing, which it really shouldn't, but you know, it, it, it is always a, a give and take there. Um, the, another thing, especially when it, when it comes to rating, things like rating, writing, you know, um, you generally train these systems on human raters, and then the system is just, especially the weighting of indices, the weighting of the, uh, of the markers of writing quality, the system will then just try to become a human to the, to the biggest extent possible. And you know, while we might think that, that integrating the CEFR descriptors here is, is good in terms of uh, construct uh, fidelity, this may not necessarily work because the CFR descriptors were not designed for this particular purpose. And um, when you actually design a writing rating system or speaking rating system, um, different considerations will likely come to the fore. Claudia talked about technology aided assessment. So enabling assessment in times of pandemic replatformed assessment is better than no assessment. So Sometimes, and I think many of us have probably had to do that, just move everything online and sort of try to make it work as best we could. Um, the questions that come from that have been raised by pretty much all of us. You know, how does technology impact the construct? How do we deal with cheating when we can't actually have the test takers co-present in the room with us? And what about technical issues? I think this is a real big concern. You run online assessments, you run online tests. What if the internet crashes? It happens. And what if the test taker doesn't have a great computer? Are you gonna give a great computer to every test taker? You're gonna make sure that everyone has excellent um, internet connections. Those are, those are concerns that we sort of have to think about and get our heads around, I think. Um, Denise's presentation, Denise talked mostly about two major things um, where technology can be used advantageously. So technology aided learning, giving feedback to students, giving immediate feedback on student performance and thereby allowing students reflection and revision, um, which is great, it has its place. And you know, these, these, these uh, training systems already exist, um, but it, it only has a place. It is not the one thing because all it can test is explicit knowledge. You have time to think about it. You have time to rephrase. Automatization speaking is not really testable that way. And you know, uh, fossilization at best is a controversial concept. Um, the, the Tesla system of, um, interesting, interestingly chosen name though, um, of assessment authentication, this is certainly um, a, a big area of work that has also been going on for some years now. And having a one a solution that integrates everything would be a big advantage. Um, it's very good for continuous assessment, medium stakes kind of assessments. But I would always be very, very cautious with AI tools. Um, all you need to do is read a book about AI with lots of funny examples of how AI does not recognize a giraffe because it hasn't been trained on recognizing giraffes. Makes you kind of a bit cautious about what AI can and cannot do. And um, I'll mention now, and I'll come back to that issue a bit later, remote proctoring has become a big, big business uh, during the pandemic, during all a lot of remote examination. And ProctorU, one of the biggest companies in the space of remote proctoring, has just completely dropped AI. They're no longer using AI at all for their proctoring. They're only going to use human proctors now. Luke sort of showed us the way forward. Well, he showed us the obstacles on the way forward mostly. So the, the question of ethical issues. So how do, how do we then put an ethical framework around this? Um, 
uh, we need to be very aware of what the use of technology and testing does and can do, what the consequences, the potential consequences are, uh, things like gaming the test, where the where test takers write to the online system to uh, try to get as good a score as possible from the online system. At the same time, if you make scoring um, categories available, you know, test takers get trained on what raters think as well, and they can get trained to an unbelievable level of sophistication. Doesn't mean that they can actually write term papers later. The, the very interesting issue of the theoretical stances that are baked into the system. So um, machines, and there, there's sort of there's sort of an insidious side to this that. If something is scored by a machine, people tend to think, well, you know, it's a machine. Machines are incorruptible and they will always score the same way. Well, yes, but the machine didn't program itself. A human programmed that machine. So the, the actual values that are in the scoring system and in the scoring mechanism are very important to interrogate. And the, the issue of surveillance, intrusiveness, and privacy um, is certainly one that has greatly increased in uh, interest recently, particularly with the uh, uh, remote proctoring that has been going on. So Luke's suggestion for ethical standards for working on greater awareness of test consequences, you know, work that has been going on, especially in my um, department, but in many other places as well, for quite a while, and um, language assessment literacy, uh, working on language assessment literacy for all stakeholders. I want to make some comments on this and bring it together a bit and then open up for a more general discussion. Um, I think we're dealing with some familiar and some new aspects here when we talk about technology and testing. So yes, we, we have dealt before and we have had time to think about adaptive testing and what it can do, where the issues are, automated scoring, what it can do and where the issues are. What is really unfamiliar to us is remote high stakes testing where we um, work remotely for, for um, institutions like open universities, this is not such an unusual thing, but for the big tests, so TOEFL and Duolingo, for example, and I now count Duolingo as one of the big tests. It took me a while to get that far, but I do now. TOEFL and Duolingo do remote online testing, IELTS and PTE do not. So there is clearly there are clearly different decisions having been made, and one of the biggest third party providers, as I said, in this area has now moved entirely to human proctoring, has abandoned AI um, for a variety of reasons. That they, if you follow the link, well, you probably can't, but I'm happy to provide it. Um, you just go to their website, and they have a statement on why they gave up AI um, that are very interesting to read. So we are now, I think, in the process of catching up on the unfamiliar aspects of, of this enterprise. And there is a big role for ethics and standards and frameworks in this brave new world. And I think uh, professional organizations can play a big role in this. I'm not so sure the CEFR can, but organizations like IALTA and ILTA can certainly have a big role. And I think one principle that can help us frame these different considerations is the principle of beneficence. So Kunin, and uh, was not the first one to talk about that, but Kunin sort of propagated that principle in his 2004 paper, um, where the idea is that on balance, a test should have more positive than negative consequences. So a test should help more than, than it should hurt for all stakeholders. And if we think of um, moving something, moving a big test to remote testing um, for test takers, the problem, you know, the drawback is they, their privacy is invaded. So if, you, if they have to show a 360 degree view of their room, if they have to stare at the screen the entire time, cannot talk, that is an invasion of privacy. On the other hand, they avoid walking out the door and catching a potentially deadly disease. So can we weigh that? For the test makers, giving up the control over standardization is a very scary process, process prospect. And 
it does require extra technical infrastructure, hiring a third party provider that will eat into your um, profits. And, but on the other hand, you want to ensure test taker safety. That's your ethical obligation as a test maker. So how do you weigh that? You know, how much of one weighs more than the other? For SCORE end users, SCORE end users, and I was on committees like that, were confused about this pivot of some of the big tests. And we're wondering of do the score still mean the same thing, but on the other hand, they don't want to just completely give up on it because it does impact their own operations. So to make this a little and I'm almost done, I just want to show you something a bit hands on to show you this invasion of privacy is quite a real thing. This is what happens if you want to do the Duolingo test. These are the screens that you get. Ensure you're always fully visible. Do not leave the test. Do not speak unless instructed. Do not allow others in the room with you. Do not use outside reference materials. Always keep your microphone and camera enabled. You have to follow six pieces of instruction here. Otherwise, if you, if you miss one of those, your test will be invalid. So, you know, is that worth it? Is that, wor is that, is that fair to test takers? What level of risk of leaving the house justifies this level of invasion of privacy and frankly liberty, because you cannot leave your, your testing space for the hour, 45 minutes of your test. You cannot go to the bathroom. Is that justifiable? These considerations may, may well change somewhat post pandemic when it's no longer dangerous to leave your house. And in many places like the UK, it's becoming increasingly less risky to leave your house. Um, that may well, the, these balances may shift, but there are some things that won't change. We continue to need a reliable IT infrastructure because technology will not go away. It will, it will only grow in its role. I think we need to be very, very cautious about AI. Um, ETS, I know for scoring writing, does not use entirely AI. They have an AI-based system, but there's always a human score or co-scoring. As Luke said, we need transparency. We need increased language assessment literacy. And I really like the idea of test taker voices. I really do think we need to listen to test takers. And I think we also, and this is our long-term project and needs to be our long-term commitment, tests need to become more practical, more convenient, more tailored, and they are very stressful. I mean, I don't know when was the last time you took a four-hour test, but it's a stressful thing to do. They are very stressful, even under normal circumstances, they're quite intrusive. So beneficence is the watchword of the day, in my view. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Carsten. Okay, um, so if our panelists would all like to uh, turn on their cameras and microphones to be available for questions. We've already had some very interesting discussion in the chat and uh, several people, Luke and, and Claudia, you've been responding to questions that have come up uh, in the chat already. Uh, we may revisit some of those. We will open the floor if people would like to take the mic. Um, so put your hand up, use your icon to raise your hand. And uh, Richard, it'll take a couple of seconds. Richard can open up uh, your microphone to allow you to speak to the floor if you like. Uh, so just raise your hand if you if you would like to do that. Um, so let's see. We've got a couple of some of the questions have already been answered in the chat there. Um, but I think a common thread that ran through uh, mentioned by Linda Taylor about the change in constructs uh, as well and the change in construct in speaking. Are we seeing an impact on the change in the construct, the very construct of speaking because of the way we are using technology and communication? Uh, so perhaps we could open that up uh, to the floor to get your thoughts about the impact on the very constructs we measure, but particularly with speaking. Or oh, we can have reflective silence. Um, <laughs> I, I, can, I can say something if you want, Jamie. Yes, go ahead, Luke. Yeah, uh, in, in response to that, um, I, I mean, I think, yes, of course, there's huge changes in how we are communicating. Um, we're involved in one right now. And I think that those changes mean that we've learned 
new kind of interactional styles um, and the fact that this kind of communication is going to be here for, for a long time um, you know indicates that we need to take seriously this form of communication um, and try to, to sort of model that in, in test tasks. Um, again, you know, I would say that in fact, this modeling this kind of commu communication is more complex um, rather than less because it is online and it involves, um, you know, the, the technology brings with it different affordances. Um, Carsten will probably be able to tell us something about turn taking um, in online environments, I'm sure, um, and how it could be different from, you know, face to face. And how does that then, you know, impact uh, the way that we assess? It's not necessarily a case of just trans translating a face to face uh, in person communication construct online. They're different modalities. Um, but I think Carsten or, or Claudia or Denise might want to say something more. Yes, they, they, they are definitely different modalities and, you know, just as a very simple example for an online interaction, people don't worry about it if two, three, four, five seconds pass between me sending you a message and you sending me a message. If that happens in spoken communication, I would think you've died, you know, I mean, that much time never passes in spoken communication. So, and dealing with the different um, issues that you have when you are in an online chat, for example, not knowing if the other person is typing, what happens with that particular kind of overlap? How do you manage all that? And it's sort of a hybrid between writing and speaking. That's all, you know, that, that's all very different from how we are testing speaking. Um, we certainly wouldn't have a monologic online chat. You know, I mean, a lot of our speaking tests are semi-direct and we just ask test takers to speak for one minute and so on. You wouldn't do that when it's uh, when you're testing something like chatting. So there, there, there are a lot of un, uh, unexplored territories here, I think. And I think the, 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 the technology, the real world use of the technology will have to influence in the long run how we design our tests. Um, I think that's that's sort of a that's sort of a kind of a safe construct question, and we can have you know fun discussions on that. But the 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 whole issue of as one person raised in the chat just now, if you do online testing, be it in an open university. Uh, uh, environment or be it in a, in a high stakes uh, test environment like IELTS or TOEFL, if you do online testing, um, what about test takers who don't have the access to the technology? You know, I mean, there, there is a real uh, issue of, of inequality here that can be amplified by that. And that's, that's one, of the, one of the simple things to raise, not simple to deal with, but simple to raise. And there are a lot of other possible issues here. So, yes, I think definitely there are a lot of impact on the construct from wanted and unwanted from different perspectives and angles. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, uh, Carson. I, you've just answered yes to the question in the chat there from Gavin, I see, about the inequality raised by the pandemic in terms of access to technology. I see Harry has asked a question that apart from a bathroom need, aren't the rules established for home-based testing the same as those for center-based testing. So I guess is the implication, is it really any more of an imposition on uh, freedom than it would be going to an IELTS or a TOEFL um, test center to take a test? So for starters, you have to use your own computer, your own internet connection in places where that's metered, that's costing you extra money. The other thing is when I do a, when I take a test in a test center, I can occasionally lean back and start, stare at the ceiling. If I do that in a proctored online test, mm. I'm out. Okay. okay. So, so you, I mean, read, I read through this for Duolingo and I read through it for TOEFL. It basically means you have to sit like this for the entire time. You must not look away from your computer because there could be someone behind the computer helping you. That's, a, that's, quite, that's quite a demand. On the other hand, you don't have to leave your house, don't have to expose yourself to risk. And you know, with a, with a test center model, the problem is always in some countries, some people have to travel for a day 
to get to the test center and then have to spend the night in a hotel and then have to travel back and have all these extra expenses and all this extra trouble, which you don't have if you do it from home. So once again, once again, we're weighing things here. What is what weighs more? I think Thank Denise you. has something to say about that as well. Yeah. Um, there is, we found one big advantage for using Tesla, which is not so, um, <laughs> not like Duolingo. And this, we have a lot of students who um, have issues with mobility, etc. And we have to send people to their house and sit with them. And sometimes they have to have rests if they have um, a medical problem. And we found that with Tesla and the way that we trained the system, the way it worked, we have to send someone to the house and the people felt more relaxed and they told us when they were going to have a rest, et cetera. So there are advantages, but I'm not um, saying there are a lot of problems still to be solved. If you're under so much duress, how can you perform well, especially when you're, you know, speaking in another language. And I find that myself when I'm in France, you know, um, if you can relax a bit more and not worry too much about the answers when you're in conversation. Whereas my husband doesn't worry about what tense he's in, but I worry about fixing it all. It's in my head, well, the moment's passed and practice makes perfect. But there are some advantages for people who cannot come to test centers, etc. Okay, thank you. And uh, we've got a comment from Gudrun and Judith, two questions or points that are raised and a couple of attendees with their hands raised, which uh, uh, Richard, if you can um, give them access or go to the questions from Gudrun and Judith first. So Gudrun says, thank you uh, for a very interesting so symposium, Luke and Carsten and all. Um, regarding test taker agency and involvement, which is very much uh, promoted in the Swedish national assessment system, could you please elaborate a bit on methods uh, uses, possible limitations, et cetera, in relation to the use of technology with test taker agency. Would anyone like to respond to that? Well, Luke just wrote a paper about it, so I think maybe he can respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jamie, I was actually just looking for Gudrun's comment so I could sort of read it. Um, is it in the Q&A? It's in the chat. It's in the oh, chat. Oh, it's in the chat. Okay, hang on okay. a second. Okay. I just, I just want to... Uh, um, oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, test taker agency and involvement. Could you please elaborate a bit on methods, uses, possible limitations? Um, so, I think... If I understand you correctly, Gudrun, you're talking about the use of uh, kind of the use of technology to sort of enhance test taker agency and involvement, um, or perhaps you're you're talking just sort sort of more generally about test taker agency and involvement. Um, I mean, I think that one of the interesting things that technology can bring, and this is also related um, perhaps to some of the issues that have been coming up in the Q and A. Um, around um, I inclusiveness um, and, you know, um, a, sort of helping candidates with specific learning differences. I think the one thing that technology can really do well, obviously, is um, individualized provision and tailored provision. And I think that this is where technology can best be harnessed. You know, I think for many, many years now, we've been talking about shifting away from high stakes, standardized, one size fits all assessment um, into other kinds of more learner focused assessment like diagnostic assessment, dynamic assessment, um, changing the approach really. Um, and technology can allow that because we can much more easily give um, individualized um, assessment options to test takers. Um, of course, I think that helps if we can consult with test takers first, and that's where the agency and involvement comes in. Um, and I think that um, 
I mean, I was thinking about the comment I made towards the end about test taker advocacy and so on. One of the big difficulties I think we have with withdrawing in test takers to the discussions we have are that test takers are to some extent fleetingly on our scene. You know, they prepare for a test, they take the test, and then they go and do something else really interesting. And we're still talking about testing. Um, so we need to somehow think of a way to capture the voices of test takers um, and to feed that into our practices. Um, but at the same time, recognizing that their aims and their kind of investment in what we do is, is quite different um, to what we do. And, and in fact, sometimes test takers also might have their own ideas about what they value, such as a cheap test, an easy test, um, an accessible yeah. test, which are very much at odds with what we value, which is, you know, a sort of the Rolls Royce of constructs and, and so on. Um, so it's a very difficult um, issue. But I do think that what is notable, I think, about a conference like Yalta or like LTRC is that we don't really hear much from test takers, you know, and I think in the same way that in medicine, there has been this sort of shift towards patient centered care, and and promoting the voices of, of patients, those people who are actually affected by the practices, I think we need to see the same thing happening in, in language assessment. Um, okay. but I'm not sure how. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you very much. Lee. So we've got a couple, uh, one person, they, uh, I'd like to get to Judith's question, who is back there talking about and then uh, David has his hand up we'll let him take the floor and um, we may need to I might bring in uh, Jing because I think it kind of brings together a lot of the themes about taking it to that upper level of what can we do as an organization about this and talk about that as well if we get some time as well so just going back to um, Judith's question in the Q&A here uh, talking about another issue is to take into account with regard to AI is that it is based on algorithms with typical or average students candidates. How will AI handle atypical candidate, candidates, example, students with disabilities? Um, so okay. that, I don't know, Denise, if you have in the Tesla any experience of that. Um, we, um, what we do with, um, in those situations where that if there was someone with a disability, um, they were given as you would face to face extra time. And that would be assessed in, in that way or, um, an amanuensis. Mm -hmm because we're not that advanced to, to deal with those sort of issues. But we dealt with things as, we, as you would do fairly in a face-to-face -face condition. Thank you. Uh, and I guess the idea of the, the algorithms in the underlying AI for atypical candidates, built on typical candidates, is very similar to the arguments around pronunciation and the native speaker, which also came up in the chat, the idea of our pronunciation models. Are, they, are we norming them on um, who are we norming them on? And, and that will have uh, implications for whether people uh, come from that group when they're assessed by the automated scoring. We might uh, move to uh, David, who's had his hand up and has can have the mic. So David, would you like to ask your question, please? Is that me? Yeah. Yeah, hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I was just, uh, yeah, yeah, can, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Well, uh, it's uh, it, one one of the points previously made was the, the these online proctoring systems that they technology based invigilation that it, it's extremely strict, which I uh, I agree with, um, uh, but probably I I am suggesting that it is not without good reason. Um, my in the online era, <laughs> in the COVID era, um, a number of my colleagues um, reported widespread cheating. Um, and of course, these, these online systems were makeshift systems with a lot of imperfections, which uh, unfortunately students or candidates seem to, 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 to be all too ready to use <laughs> the opportunities. Uh, my own experience as a um, 
um, a Moodle-based test just recently administered to about 170 students where um, I know it's a simple system, but we, we had very little. I mean, I had uh, PhD students uh, help in the invigilation and we were there in the room, um, uh, but couldn't uh, uh, do much more. And it was, uh, they, one of the questions was, was about triangulation, the methodology from, from action research, an important concept. And uh, many of the answers were copied straight from Wikipedia, but that Wikipedia entry was about geodesy. <laughs> this is the point of the joke. So the triangulation, the term comes from, or has some background in, or, or it, it's a metaphor really. Thank, thank you, David. We, we are gonna have to rush, so can, um, could we, because we're gonna run out of time and I'd like to open up. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, just supporting my, uh, my point that we should also, probably, probably I, I, I believe that the strictness of, of, of online proctoring is not without good reason. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Now I'd like to go to the comment by Jing because I think it brings it back into that broader discussion and probably opening it up a little bit to the ELTA community about what we can do. So what would be a good channel to raise these concerns over ethics of using technologies, uh, we test providers fear adding so many new things into the testing practice too quickly, but we're also pressured to meet customer needs during the pandemic. Test users' priorities as of today is getting students tested. So how can we let this discussion of ethics penetrate to test users? And I, and I guess from this perspective, we might open it up specifically to Elta. Carsten, you mentioned um, it's not really about our framework, something like the CFR. It's, it's broader, and Luke also brought this in um, the idea of, you know, where do we talk about the guidelines for good practice? Where do we talk about um, uh, advocacy? What, what can we do as a community uh, in order to engage with some of these issues? So um, we'd like to open that, that out to the floor to get people's ideas. And also from the, from the wider audience, uh, Peter as president of ELTA, if anyone would like to chip in to th say, is there something we should be doing? as a community or can do. Jamie, you asked me. What I was thinking about was just whether we didn't actually need to form a special interest group on technology-driven assessment because there's so many issues involved and it's certainly a thing of the future. And yep. society will be asking for that too, and, and for quality services. So mm -hmm. uh, we should really uh, kneel into that and probably do that, something, get active. That, that's a good point because uh, recently there's a, a SIG on automated rating has been formed as a part of the ILTA. Um, uh, so that might be something and having interaction between those SIGs would be quite interesting. I wonder, you know, it's, it's not going back to the 80s and having computer assisted language assessment or something. It's about the wider ethics and technology, a SIG with that broader, um, that broader focus on it. Luke, Luke, you mentioned a working group in ILTA that had been dealing a task force. Would you, would you be able to say any more about that? Um, I can't say much, but I can invite Benjamin Kreml um, to say something because he was chairing that task force. Um, but ben Benjamin and I were having a discussion just this morning about his work on that. Um, and the fact that, you know, a lot is, is already there in the codes of ethics and the issue is not necessarily new. Well, ben Benjamin, do you want to, jump in here and, and say something. Um, yeah, okay, I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so the, the work of the task force was, was really just to um, revise the code of ethics and the guidelines for practice. And, and that work is basically done. Uh, the, the new revised version is still to be ratified by the, the ILTA um, membership, but, but the work of the task force is, is kind of wrapped up. And as, as Luke was sort of um, hinting at, I think the key thing we need to look at is not really uh, like how different wordings in these documents uh, are, are formulated, but it's how, what role we want these documents to play and what, what, what actions we want to take as testing associations or organizations uh, in enforcing uh, good practice or ethical practice. So it's not really whether 
there's an additional statement on technology uh, because I think broadly what we've been talking about also this morning is already there in these documents. It's coming to terms with what role do we want our organizations to play and do we really want to, what, what uh, opportunities or possibilities of sanctioning do we have when there is uh, unethical behavior and, and these kinds of things. So much in, in line with also what Bart in his Alte um, keynote was kind of opening up as, as interesting questions for us that um, I think we need to answer or tackle more broadly. And that should be where our, where our energy is focused rather than on discussing wordings. Um, and I see Claudia, you have your hand up there. Yeah, just briefly, thanks, Benny. I fully agree with that perspective and also with the associations and the test providers considering the ethics in the use of technology. But I would also reiterate, it would be really important to get test takers on board and their perspective, because as far as I can see, none of our six really well, opens up to the test takers and invites them or our associations. And I guess that's a perspective that would make really sense to listen to to those who take the tests. And we did feedback, we, we got feedback from our students and hardly anybody complained about the online exams and everybody was like, well, that's the best we could do in that situation. So we were trying to listen to the students and see what we could learn from them. Uh, but I think that's something we really should improve as a professional association. Okay, that's great. Now, I'm gonna to go to Norman now. Norman, you've got your hand up. Um, and then we might draw to a close to give us all some time to, if any of the panelists would make to like a, a last one line comment on the key takeaway, that would be fine as well. But I think after we get Norman's uh, question, we might move to closing with the final comments from the panel. Okay, okay it was not it was not quite a question, it's a, a suggestion. Maybe uh, the next uh, Yalta conference, we could invite some students having experience with the language test and to talk about their experiences and thinking about a kind of invited symposium, which mm. is a little bit guided by some people and letting uh, students talk because it would be a good experience for uh, professionals too, to be able to talk to students which are maybe not at level C1 in English. That is, um, that is a really interesting idea, Norman, and it gels with a lot of the presentations today about that agency and the student voices and the test taker voices and the need to bring that in. So um, uh, if Christoph is not here today, uh, Zoltan, that might be something we wanna discuss with Christoph for next year. That sounds like a really good idea. So yeah, thank thanks. you very much to um, all of the panelists. Really interesting, a lot of synergy, a lot of uh, uh, sort of overlapping ideas there that have built on it, I think. And, you know, including as Luke sort of pointed out, moving out from our field, it's thinking about being part of a wider uh, discussion on this. And this is something I think Denise brought as well, that a lot of the issues we're dealing with, they're overlapping and, and they're, they're broader. Would any of the panel, um, Carsten, would you like to make any final comments about where you'd like to see us go or final, um, final words of wisdom? Uh, I'll open it up to the floor if you'd like to, and then we'll close the panel. I, I don't know about wisdom, but I think I think what what's taking shape here is that we need a discussion about uh, um, the benefits and the drawbacks of technology in, in the different areas of testing in terms of the test delivery, in terms of test administration from the perspective of different stakeholders. And we need um, kind of a coherent model of the, the various ways technology impacts testing so that we can then think about how we can maximize benefits and minimize drawbacks, really. And on those words of wisdom indeed, thank you, Carsten. Um, I think we shall bring the symposium to a close. Thank you very much, Denise, Luke, Claudia, and Carsten for your participation. Apologies again from Martin Farrows who from Soapbox Labs in uh, Ireland, who was going to take part, but due to unforeseen circumstances, wasn't able to join us today. And thank you all for the audience for your wonderful comments and interaction and discussion. And I will now hand over, uh, Richard, if you want to give any comments and we close the session for people to go for a break. Okay, no, thank you everybody. That was really good. And uh, there are a lot of questions that we couldn't answer there. So, uh, but we have to stop. We've got a, a 25 minute break now. So we will come back at 11.30 for the parallel sessions. 
So we will hope to see you there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
Hi. Hello. Um, Benjamin, will you be talking? Hi, Ness. Nice. Sorry. Hello. Um, my connection, I'm, I mean, I'm not at home and my connection is not fantastic. It's been working, but every now and then. So because you, as you're there, I'm relaxed. Okay. So I hope <laughs> I will see everything, but you never know. Um, I don't know whether Tineke and uh, Luke will be talking, the two of them. Hi. Hi, Luke. Hello. How are you? Fine, and you? I was wondering whether it would be you who talked because yeah. Luke has been on for a while now. <laughs> no, no, we can't have that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> enough is enough. <laughs> yes, he will be. I mean, he might join in for the uh, questions afterwards. Okay. and. I think he'll keep an eye on the chat. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, I, I'll, I'll try to keep a good eye on the chat and the question and answers. But as I was telling Richard, I'm not at home, so my connection is a bit strange. But it should work. How's life? Very busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but a good busy. Okay. Mm. Good. Fine. How's life for you? In theory, I'm retired, and now I'm supposed to be on holiday. I'm on the coast, uh, on the. I'm, I'm actually in a hotel, and okay. uh, and um, my real landscape is something like you with the sea at the back, <laughs> something like your background. What they call holidays these days, right? Yeah, yeah. Joining in at the altar, sharing sessions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, attending the AGM was even more sort of <laughs> important, as it were. I think I'm going to ask for a medal. <laughs> yes, I think you deserve one now. Um, Richard, is this session going to be recorded? Uh um, we're still recording. No, it's not yes. going to be recorded. <laughs> Let me stop that. Thank you for that reminder. So I'll stop that now. Yeah.